Listen to this quote. <coughs> Calvin's Genevan Psalter was reprinted an amazing 62 times in its first two years. 62 reprints in two years. And it was translated into 24 languages. The four reforms then. Church discipline, marriage ordinances, catechetical instruction, and congregational psalm singing. But there's something else that is very striking about Calvin's return to Geneva. It is his graciousness to his enemies who had treated him so badly like dirt for 20 months. Calvin comes back being received in honour and he did not recriminate or take vengeance. He did not gloat over his enemies that he had been restored. And this Calvin was like Jonathan Edwards in Northampton. He was shamefully treated by the congregation, which allegedly had had such great revivals whenever, Cal whenever Edwards wished to reform the church and bring his practice of the administration of the Lord's Supper back to the biblical form. They promptly voted him out, and the vote wasn't even close. So much for their revival. Whenever Reformation came in, out he goes. Then, the congregation in Northampton had some problems. They couldn't fill their pulpit many a Sunday. And the only person they could ask was Edwards. And they asked him, he expounded the scriptures, never said a word about shameful treatment, and left. Calvin, like Edwards two centuries later, went about his work as a servant of Jesus Christ. His first sermon back in St. Pierre's Cathedral picked up where he had left off in his preaching three years earlier with just the next text in his expository declaration of the word. There were many battles left though to be fought in Geneva with the opponents of God's word. These folk are generally called the libertines, libertines from the word liberty. They wanted freedom not to obey God and love their neighbour. They wanted freedom to sin. You've guessed it, what they especially did not like was church discipline and sharp expository preaching. They were what we would call antinomians. We don't need the law of God, we can live whatever way we please. These men even had the audacity to teach that the communion of the saints, a phrase from the Apostles' Creed, the communion of the saints meant that we could commit adultery with one another's wives, wife swapping, because we have all things in common, including our wives. That was what was going on in Calvin's Geneva, mind you, this filthy practice. Calvin wrote very sharp things against these wicked libertines came down to their exclusion from the Lord's Supper. These ungodly wretches came into church on the Lord's Day and reckoned that they should be permitted to partake of the body and blood of Christ. Calvin descended from the pulpit and stood before the table. These hands you may crush, these arms you may cut off, my life you may take, but you shall never force me to give holy things to the profane and dishonor the table of my God. There was a stunned silence in church. The libertines withdrew and the Lord's table was celebrated in peace and solemnity. That's the libertines. Calvin in his day instead of being honoured by the wretched, wicked folk of Geneva as a servant of Jesus Christ, had names made up for him. Instead of referring to him as Calvin, they called him Cain, submitting two, subtracting two of the letters from his name, at least in our English formulation. 
and of course being an apostate. A good number of the dogs in the city of Geneva were named after Calvin. The idea being that you could kick them. Because you can't kick the man himself, that's a hard thing to do. And you can kick the dog in Calvin's place. Calvin was publicly abused whenever he went out by some of these people. And they called him the second ranked devil in hell. Probably only just a hair's breadth behind Satan himself. When he preached, some old folk in the cathedral of St. Pierre's in Geneva, some old folk muttered. There they were when he was preaching in the pews, muttering paternosters and Hail Marys because they were so deeply entrenched in the old Roman Catholic idolatry that they couldn't get used to hearing somebody preach. In Roman worship, the priest goes up and mutters and a few things in Latin that you can't understand way up front in the gilded part of the worship service and you just sit there and pray. And here was Calvin preaching and they just muttered and the consistory would have to admonish them. The word of God is being preached. You listen to the word of God and you be silent. Christ is speaking. Plenty of time to pray at home and don't be praying to Mary either. No Hail Marys. Pray to God through Jesus Christ. So bad was it that there were other people in the church who had no respect for Christ's voice in the preaching that they were shouting and whistling and making rude noises. That's what was going on. There were the elect of God, sheep in the congregation, but there was a wicked, wretched faction there too. And this second Genevan ministry of Calvin is typically divided into two periods. And I think this is a helpful classification. There's the period from 1541 to 1555. 14 years. These are the years of great opposition. Great opposition. He's been kicked out, he's come back, but these are still years of great opposition. Then there are the years 1555 to 1564, and these are the years of less opposition. There's always opposition to the Word of God, even in a true church. But there's just less opposition from within the true church in these last nine years. The turning point was 1555. One, five, 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 three fives. Easy to remember. 1555. At this time, Calvin's opponents made some serious <coughs> political blunders once again. Some of them were banished and others left Geneva in shame. So that's the enemies reduced in power and numbers. On the other hand, Calvin's supporters began to increase. And they increased in two ways. Many of the Genevans, at first hostile to the word of God, were won over to the truth by Calvin's preaching. And as well as that, there was immigration. That is, godly persecuted Protestants from various parts of Europe, but especially France, had been coming into Geneva for many years. And as they increased, they were hard-working, honest people. As they increased, there was more and more pressure for these people to be granted citizenship. And with citizenship came the vote. And whenever these people who hungered and thirsted after the word of God, who had suffered the loss of their entire livelihood for Christ's sake, came into Geneva and got the vote, well, you could tell who they're going to be voting for. They're going to vote for all those who stand in the political councils for the spread and propagation of the pure word of God. So once they had the vote, then more of the godly immigrants were given the vote, and therefore those elected became much more favorable to the reform. 